Well, good morning to all. Good morning to those uh, online with us this morning. And uh, did someone move our clock forward? <clears throat> Maybe that's the other can't like get done sooner or something. I don't know. Frank, did you do that? Okay. Uh, good morning. Well, that sun. I don't know if you were awake or in a position where you could see it, but that sunrise this morning was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it was something to see. Big and round. Looked like it was just kind of sitting on the ground. So it was a beautiful, beautiful time. Glad that you're with us this morning. <clears throat> Hope you had a good week last week. Yeah. And uh, today's the coldest day it's been for a few days. Blessed, right? 
blessed. It could be this way all the time. Right? Good morning, Amy. How are you doing, sir? Um, we, uh, we're jumping into uh, the lesson that we've been working on for a while, the number seven. Uh, we started with the first mention principle, Genesis 12, 1 and 2. And we made a summary statement, complete, finished, rest. Uh, we've gone down through it by topic rather than by verses to prove our summary statement to be correct. And we found that there are seven resurrections, there are seven mysteries, seven baptisms, and we are in the midst of the ages and the world. I uh, remember last week, <clears throat> uh, we said the difference between age and world in the Bible, world speaks of the end, and ages speaks of the period of time or dispensations until the end, including the end. Okay, so it's uh, two different words in the Bible, both of them mean something a little bit different. And uh, then we talked about God hallowing uh, certain things because the uh, subject matter is the number seven. And so we said he said he have hallows the seventh day, Genesis 2, the seventh week, Leviticus 23, the seventh month, Leviticus 23, the last half of that chapter, and the seventh year. And we looked at he, on the seventh year, he speaks to the servants, he also speaks to the land, a Sabbath of both. And then uh, groups of years, uh, seven times seven, 49 years, and uh, the uh, year of Jubilee, and now we're on the period of time. The sevens periods of time, and that's when it's gonna get kind of exciting, and you would enjoy it as well. We talked last week, uh, and the week before, this is an important thing. Scriptures, all scriptures have three uh, applications, historical, doctrinal, and spiritual or an applicational. So every scripture has a period of time historically when it was written or when it occurred. It has a particular audience or a group of people, ethnic people, of who it's directed towards or teaching, doctrinal. And it can be applied uh, in a broad way <clears throat> to many different things. And typically, we would look in the Old Testament the historical setting, the Jews is who it was written to, but there's a spiritual application of it to us in the church. So that's kind of how that goes. But that gives us uh, the review and the background. Let's start with a word of prayer and we'll get into the lesson today. I'm kind of excited about it. All right, Father, thank you today for your word, uh, the opportunity for us to be in it and enjoy it. I pray, Father, that you bless all of the things that are done today. And I pray for those that are viewing us online. Many of them um, have opted out to do that because of sickness or uh, other reasons. And I just thank you for them. And I pray that you bless their attendance today. And um, Lord, may your word uh, go forth as you intended it. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So this one. Seven periods of time. Um, now, <clears throat> when we talk about periods of time, we also use the word dispensations. I gave you a dis I think I gave you a definition last week, week about dispensation, a period of time when God has, is, or will deal differently with humankind as they relate to God. A time, a period of time when God has, is, or will deal differently with humankind as they relate to God. And so, um, when we look at dispensations or periods of time in the Bible, let's just take a random guess. How many do you think there are? Seven. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. So, I'm going to give them to you, and we're going to look at them just so you get an idea of it. The first one, all right, is uh, uh, the Edenic, E D. E N Eden Ick I C Eden dispensation and it goes from the creation Genesis 1 1 to the fall Genesis 3 and this is what's called the age or the dispensation of innocence innocence so G Genesis 1 1 to Genesis 3 24 uh, that's the period of time 
it deals with. It's referred to as the Eden Ick, Eden Mick dispensation, and it is the dispensation of innocence. Uh, Adam and Eve were innocent, and um, they lost their innocence when she looked upon the fruit, saw that it was pleasant to the eyes, uh, desired to be wise, and she partook of the fruit and lost her innocence. What's the first thing we see in the scriptures after they lost their innocence? What did they want to do? Hide. So, so fig guilt and shame. Yep. They fig, fig leaves, sowed fig leaves, and then hid themselves in the garden. So innocence was lost. So then from Genesis 4, verse 1, to Genesis 8, verse 19, we have the Antediluvian dispensation. I'll spell it for you. A N T E A N T E dash D I L U V I A N. Antediluvian dispensation. This runs from Adam to Noah or the flood. Adam to Noah or the flood. And it is called the dispensation of conscience. Men, women did what they thought was right based upon their conscience. All right. There was no written law. There was no indication that there was anything given other than God just allowed them to exist and relate to conscience. All right, and then we have the third one. If the first one is the anta, the, this, the third one is the post, post-Diluvian dispensation. And this runs from Noah to Abraham, and it involves human government. That's uh, the dispensation of human government. Human government. So, God established uh, a hierarchy of family, and the hierarchy of family dispensed rules, regulations, etc. Human government. Noah to Ab Abraham. And that runs from Genesis 8.20 to Genesis 11.9. There's 325 years between the flood and the Tower of Babel. 325 years. Human government. And then with Abraham, God starts a new period of time or a new dispensation. It's the periodical dispensation. P A T R I A R. C H A L Patriarchal Dispensation. This runs from Abraham to Moses or the book of Exodus. And this dispensation is the dispensation of family. And it's how they were related by family. This is Genesis eleven ten. Through Exodus 25, excuse me, Exodus 12, verse 51, and it covers 430 years. So you have the dispensation of innocence, the dispensation of conscience, uh, the dispensation of human government. You have the dispensation of family, and then five, the legal dispensation. The legal dispensation. This is from Moses to Christ or Moses to the cross, and it is the dispensation of law. And it runs from Exodus 13, verse 1, to the end of the Gospels. <clears throat> the dispensation of law. And again, these are just real clear periods of time throughout the Bible, where you see God deals with humankind differently, 
as they relate to him. So no one, just as an example, no one said to Adam, uh, you got to keep the law. Why? Because it hadn't been written yet. So God dealt differently with him. Then all of a sudden, uh, here comes on the scene, <clears throat> Moses, he goes up to Mount Sinai, brings down the tables of stone, and then he rehearses what God wrote with his finger and said, this is our direction. This is how we approach God. Each one of these is a different way that God set up, very clear in the Bible, where God says, I want you to relate to me this way, periods of time. So we have the legal one, the fifth one. The sixth one is the ecclesiastical dispensation. And this is Christ to the Antichrist. We call this the dispensation of grace. And it covers the church, the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming. Paul makes reference to this often. Uh, a, a dispensation of the gospel has been committed to me. This is the gospel of the grace of God. Um, it uh, deals with the church, the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming. And then you have uh, that period of time, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, through Revelation 19, verse 21. So the dispensation of grace it is spoken of in that in that um, uh, period of time. And then, <clears throat> that's the sixth one, here's the seventh, and that's the Messianic dispensation. That's a thousand year reign of Christ, and it's referred to in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> so now, what we've been saying all along, correct? is you have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then what? Six. Rest. Right? And then what happens after that? Start all over. You start all over. All right, octave up, right? <clears throat> so we have one, two, three, four, five, six. The seventh dispensation is what? The millennial rest, mm -hmm. okay? And so what happens next? Look in your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And whoever gets that, read the first verse. Revelation 21, verse 1. Don't be bashful. <clears throat> and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And therefore was no more sea. Okay, so what do we have? Octave up. Something new. Mm -hmm. So eight in the Bible is new beginnings. Mm -hmm. And the eighth dispensation is Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth. So you have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, rest, seven. And then eight is an octave up. So this this theme goes all the way through the Bible over and over again. <clears throat> We've tried to look at it <clears throat> in these periods of time, and we're going to just put dispensations here. And all we've been trying to do is illustrate the number seven. When God does something, he does it in sevens. He always does it in sevens. He has that whole history of seven. And we look at it even within the history of these sevens, is you have the seven dispensation, you have the seven feasts. Uh, it just over and over and over again, you see the seven pops up all the time. Now, <clears throat> there's a reason why I've done all of this. Turn to Hosea. Don't forget, if you need to use the uh, index, nobody will be upset with you. The other day I tried to find this. And uh, how long did I look for it? Long time, didn't I? <laughs> Somebody took Hosea out of my Bible. Hosea chapter 12, and uh, it comes uh, right before Joel and right after uh, Daniel. 
So you should be able to get it there. Could have had Hayden give that to us. He's memorized all the books of the Bible, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, Hosea chapter 12. And a God has chosen in his Bible a particular method of teaching. All right? A particular method of teaching is how God does it. Hosea chapter 12, and look at verse number 10. I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. So, similitude. Do you all know what a similitude is? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you know what a similitude is? All right. This is what a similitude is. A similitude is an illustration, a story, or picture, or a word that you can associate with something else. All right? Um, it's kind of like this. If you can understand this, then that is like this. So Jesus did this, and we often think of that in the form of parables. He would say, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he'd use a similitude. He'd give some illustration, and then he'd say, now, if you can understand that, then you can understand the spiritual side. In the Bible, it is always this way. If you can understand this physical, then that illustrates the spiritual. And they're called similitudes. And um, <clears throat> I remember the first time that I heard this, I thought, that's kind of weird. And then I looked at all the places in the Bible. You know, I, when I read through the Bible, I focus on a particular thing. I started looking at this particular phenomena of similitudes, and I thought, the whole Bible is filled with it. I just didn't even notice it. Before, when I was reading it, it just didn't make any sense. But there are two words, it's not the only two, but there are two words that really illustrate uh, the idea of similitude in the Bible. And those two words are like and as. Like and as. Those two words, um, if you can master those two words and the pictures, the similitudes that they illustrate, you master the Bible. All right? So, like and as. Two very important words. Um, so, let's just get a... I'm not going to do them all. I've only got about 50. Okay? I don't want to do them all. I have about 50. We'll do a few of each. Um, look at uh, Genesis 13. Let's start with the word... I said there are two words, right? Like and as, let's, let's first consider the word like. Uh, Genesis 13. Before we read this, I want you to go with me in your mind. God created Adam and Eve and he placed them where? In the garden. garden. The garden of Eden. Okay. So Eden is a large area. And the garden is in one spot. Eden is a huge area. But the garden of Eden is a small area within Eden. Kind of like if we say Philadelphia is a city in Pennsylvania. So this is the garden of Eden is a, a garden in the bigger area of Eden. All right, so he placed them there and uh, they fell. And so what did God do? He put cherubim at the entrance of the garden after he kicked them out, right? And now we're in Genesis 14. We're multiple generations after the Garden of Eden. And uh, who knows what the Garden of Eden looked like when Adam and Eve were given it. By the time we get to Genesis 13, no one knows what it looked like. All right? So, Look at verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. What's he doing? Is he looking back in history or is he looking at something right now? He's looking at something right now. He looked out over the plain of Jordan and he saw. All right. It was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now notice, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. 
So he gave them an example. They'd never seen the Garden of Eden. He said, if you see this, then you've seen the Garden of Eden. And he uses both those words, like and as. You see that there in verse 10? Mm -hmm. Even as the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. So he's saying, if you can see this, then you can understand that. That's the, the idea of a similitude. Look at Psalms 1. And this is not the next one. I'm just randomly picking them out so that you can get the idea. Psalms chapter 1, and look at verse 3. You've been in church long. You've heard this passage preached a hundred times. And they have used the idea of a similitude to preach the message. Notice what it says. Blessed is the man, verse 1, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You say, well, what would that look like? What does he mean? So he answers, verse 3, and he shall be like, 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 like. <laughs> this is what it is. This is verse 1 and 2. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He said, if you want to know what is, the blessed man is like, verses 1 and 2, whose law delight is in the law of the Lord, he's like a tree. Now you vision a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. What do you know about that tree? It flourishes because it's got plenty of water. And where does it get it from? It gets it from its roots. All right, so <clears throat> there's a lot to be said about that similitude. And um, <clears throat> if you go home and Google, um, blessed is the man that walketh, and you see all the sermons that are preached about that, you look at them, every one of them are based on the similitude. They'll say, okay, let me tell you about trees and that are planted next to water, and let me tell you what they can do. And what they're saying is, that's what a blessed man is like. So you can understand the spiritual from a physical thing. Look at Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Psalms 103, and look at verse 13. See, I don't really understand how to relate to God. I don't really know that much about him. I haven't seen him. I haven't heard his voice. I don't know what he's like. So the psalmist writes in Psalms 103, verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. So plainly from that, we get this inference, and there's many other scriptures that we could use. This is not our focus. If you want to know about the dynamics of who God is, look at the family. Because the family is the similitude of God. And he does this all the way through the scriptures. Remember in the New Testament he said, how many fathers would give their son a scorpion if he asked for something positive? So he's always taking us back to that father, family, if you want to understand God, then you understand the family. All right? So, you know, he gives a, a parable. Remember the parable in the New Testament? The parable was about God the Father sending his son to the earth. He said, <clears throat> a man uh, sent his servants, and the when he sent his servants, they killed him. And so the last thing he thought is that he would send his own son. They certainly would cherish his son, and they killed his son too. And he's trying to show you that, well, there's a love for servants, but there's more of a love for the son. So all these are pictures. If you want to understand God, then you understand uh, the family. All right, Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25 and verse 28. The 
terrible twos <clears throat> that are mentioned so often is about a child <clears throat> who has no boundaries and doesn't want you to give them to them. <laughs> okay? That's the terrible twos. They have no boundaries and they don't want you to give them to them. What happens if you leave a two-year-old to their own self? Not only are they going to make the world around them miserable, what are they going to do to themselves? Harm. Mm -hmm. Alright. Because they, they, they don't have any knowledge. They have no self-control. And they'll bring damage to themselves. Look at verse 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. It cannot defend itself. So he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like that city. So there has to be things inside our hearts and our minds for self-preservation that we say no to and that we say yes to. We can't just do it when we say we feel like it. We have to have these things like walls, permanent yeses and nos in our life. And he said, if you don't have them, you're like a city that doesn't have any walls. What's going to happen? You're going to get destroyed. And I have watched, I'm sure that you have family or friends that you have watched that have no self-control over alcohol, have no self-control over eating, have no self-control over many different things in their life, and it has affected them adversely. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's saying here. Uh, again, the, the similitude is if you can understand this, a city broken down, walls broken down, and the danger that puts them in, then you understand a person that doesn't have any rule over his own spirit. All right, uh, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. I've just tried to give you a cross view of the whole Bible here. We're skipping a bunch of them because if they're, it's, the whole Bible is this is how God designed to teach His Word to us. Similitude. Look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is what? Light. Light. There it is. All right. So we don't know anything about the kingdom of heaven. He said it's like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in the field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and become of the tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. He said... If you want to know about the kingdom of heaven, it is like a mustard seed. Look at verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. All right, so he says it's like leaven. And <clears throat> there's so many of these. Look at verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in the field. Look at verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man. So maybe not one of these will give you the full understanding of what the kingdom of heaven is, but if you put them all together, you get an idea of a thing that you can't conceive of, spiritual thing, with these literal examples given to us. Uh, he says it again in verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net. And uh, so this is all the way through the Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And look at verse 17. Hold on a second. I got the wrong reference. Uh, two. Sorry. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And then he comes down through and he's going to give you that. All these are little bits and pieces of the puzzle of us understanding something, who knows what the kingdom of heaven is, until you look at these individual things. So God teaches us his word through similitudes. Let's look at a few more. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And look at verse 48.
She is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like, is like, is like. Now look at verse 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my saying and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. How many of you remember singing that song when you were growing up? The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand went crash. Kids love the crash part. Okay. <laughs> now we used to destroy the whole Sunday school room, man. We destroyed that. Then, verse 49, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came down and the floods came up. But the house on the rock stood firm. Then, does, does anybody, you know that song? What's the next verse? So, build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the similitude that we even sing those songs to teach the lessons. That's the similitude that's given to us. Uh, look at Acts chapter 2. A lot of times, uh, similitudes are ignored and at great peril. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 3. This is Pentecost. And what's it say? And suddenly there came a rush from heaven as of a rush of a mighty wind, and it was and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them, verse 3, cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it sat upon each one of them. So what do we know that it wasn't? Fire. <laughs> okay. So he's saying, okay, if you want to understand what this looks like, think in your mind about fire. And he said, this is what it looked like. It wasn't fire. It was light, so that you can understand cloven tongues lighted upon them. What is that? Um, you know, he said, it's like fire. So, you get this all the way through the Bible, and if you state those things, then all of a sudden you're looking for stuff that doesn't even exist. Look at chapter 3 of Acts, and look at verse number 22. These are the ones, this one and a couple others that we'll look at, these are the ones that we usually think of when we think of similitude. Look at verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, that was other Jewish people, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. So if we want to know a lot about Jesus without consulting the New Testament, where would we go to find it? We'd look at the life of Moses. <clears throat> so that's that's the uh, the thing. And when we examine Moses' life, when we examine Jesus' life, it is amazing. So we understand Jesus by looking at Moses. And there's just one big difference between the two. <clears throat> All right. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's a New Testament verse. <laughs> okay? That's the only difference between the two. But when <clears throat> Jesus came on the scene, all right, when Moses came on the scene, what's the first thing they ask him? How do we know you came from God? And what did he do? He threw his staff down the ground. All right. When Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, what did he say? We know thou art a teacher come from God, because no man could do the miracles that you do, lest God be with you. So, so it begins that way. And was <clears throat> Moses received of his 
family? <laughs> no, they didn't want him. When Jesus came, verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 11 of John, he came to his own and his own received his not. The parallels are enormously so. So he says, if you want to understand Jesus, uh, consider Moses, because it's the Old Testament you have it there. These similitudes, these are, these are such important things that we don't even think about a lot of times until it's first uh, presented to us, and then all of a sudden we see them everywhere. Look at Acts chapter 7, and uh, we'll stop on this one, verse 37. The parallel to what we just read, but notice what he says. This, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. What's the next word? Life. Life. <laughs> All right, if you want to know about Jesus, go back and look at Moses. All right, those are a few of the ones with the word life. Let's look quickly at a few of the words of as. Let's go all the way back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 22. And again, when God wants to show us these similitudes, he's often going to use these two words, like and as. <clears throat> All right? So as. Genesis chapter 22. And uh, look, if you would, with me at verse 17. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed. What's the next word? As. As. All right, well, how much is he going to multiply? Stars of heaven. Stars of heaven. So you say, what? Yeah, how many kids am I going to have? He said, look up and see the stars. That's how many kids I'm going to give you. So it's, it's a, a similitude to show us. All right. And uh, he goes on. He says, what's the next one? And as the sand which is upon the seashore. So he gives us two pictures of how many kids he's going to end up having. All right, uh, Genesis 49. Genesis 49. This is when... Um, um, just before his death, Jacob calls his sons, 12 sons, and he speaks prophetically about each one of his sons. We get to verse 8 and verse 9. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stood, stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. So he's saying, if you want to know something about Jacob, what's going to characterize him, you think about a lion, and in this case, the lion is crouching or stooping down. He said, if you want to know about Jacob, you speak about a lion. What do we call Jesus? He's the what of Judah? Lion. A lion of the tribe of Judah. And so who's going to bow down to Jesus? All the brothers. So this is the prophetic. And again, the ad shows us that he has the characteristics of a lion. Of course, you know, it was Darwin who said through natural selection process um, that... Um, the lion became king of the jungle. But those of us who read our Bible know <laughs> that um, Darwin didn't have anything to do with the natural process, the selection process didn't have anything to do with it. It was ordained by God. And the lion is that king because he's the king of Judah. All right, uh, let's look at another one. Uh, chapter 49, look at verse 27. So Judah is one way, he continues to go on his children and bless them and uh, prophesy about them. Verse 27, he said, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. 
So if you want to know something about Benjamin, he is like a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. So you want to know the characteristics of Benjamin, the lichen as. He was like a wolf. Can you trust a wolf? Can't trust a wolf. If you follow the tribe of Benjamin through the Bible, you can't trust them. You can't trust them. Okay. Um, let's look, uh, we've got uh, a few minutes here. Let's look at Exodus 33. Exodus 33. And look at verse number 11. Now, some of what we know about the Bible, we, uh, we got from the famous movies, right? So we know how Moses got the water separated, right? Stood up there with the wind blowing in his hair and raised the rod up and all of a sudden they, you know, so the first thing we have to do is rid our minds of all those things that we saw that don't represent, or the Bible don't represent that way. And it's really hard. Especially when you come to a passage of scripture like this in Exodus 33, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. We've seen the movie, right? See him come down from Mount Sinai. Uh, Charlton Heston, wasn't it? And uh, he came down from Mount Sinai and uh, with the Ten Commandments, that big movie. Uh, but here, um, we're given a little indication that maybe is a little different than what the movie suggested. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, what's the next word? As. If you want to know how he spoke to Moses, as a man speaketh unto his friend. So that's how he did it. You say, well, you know, what the conversation sound like? Like Frank and I talking to one another. All right. So, again, the similitudes are so very, very important. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. And look at verse 5. So he brought down the people under the water. Um, <clears throat> this is Gideon. Remember, God says you have too many. <laughs> you have too many to go to battle. You need fewer. And he said, okay, uh, how many fewer? Got rid of a bunch. God says, ah, still have too many. I do. And uh, so God said to him in chapter 7 and verse number 5, Bring down the people to the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth up the water with his tongue. And you want to know how they did that? I have heard and read so many commentaries. And they didn't read the next word. How, it, how was it? As a dog lappeth up the water. You know, you know how a dog does that, don't you? Puts his face right down to it. All right. And uh, <clears throat> he said... Him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that bows down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, like a dog, okay, putting their hands to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. So God said, if you want to know how this actually looked, it's as a dog lappeth water. So these are the similitudes that help us understand the Bible uh, and also correct all those people that misunderstand the Bible, that want to teach us. Uh, lap. One last one and then we'll stop. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Again, these are just these are pictures to let us see um, an image that God would want us to see. 
Jesus is speaking. If you have a Bible and it's a red letter edition, edition, it means that these are the words of Jesus. And my words are really light, so those are always the red ones, okay? Uh, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how oft I would have gathered you, gathered thy children together. Okay, how's God going to do that? And so he answers the question. Even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and then he says they didn't want to. But that's, again, it gives us the picture. If you've ever seen a hen who has these young chicks and uh, how she corrals them with her wings and pulls those wings down and you don't even know they exist. Mm -hmm. He said, that's, that's the heart that I have. I want to be like that hen in protecting you. But you know what you can't do if you've ever seen it? You get one of those little chicks that doesn't want to get out of those wings. And you can't get them under the wing. And so here's this picture that he gives to us. We'll stop there today, but again, just an idea of the similitude. Now, there's a reason beyond just learning Bible truth about the similitudes, because we're going to move from these periods of time, dispensation, to the similitude that will show us this pattern in the history of the world. So that's, that's the reason, the similitude. And we're going to see that. It's probably a very big, important picture as we look at seven and how it fits into the history of our world. Okay? All right. Well, I hope you got something today. Don't forget those like and as. Those are such important words. And it will change your Bible study if you start looking for them. All righty? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we are indeed grateful for your goodness to us. Lord, we've gotten down in some meat today, and actually uh, wiggled our toes in it. Um, how wonderful your word is put together. Um, when I first got saved, it was just a storybook. Oh, I have found that it has gold in it, and it's much deeper than I ever thought. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us to never tire of digging in your word to find the gold nuggets of truth. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. See you in about 25 minutes for the morning service.